satisfied with anything ordinary. We won't be satisfied at all. Open up the sky, fall down like rain. We don't want blessing, we want you. Open up the sky, fall down like fire. Let's go ahead and stand up this morning as we continue in our worship. To the King of glory and light, all praises. To the only giver of life, our maker. The gates are open wide, we will worship you. Come let the lost us die. His blood, our Savior, the cross has overcome. We worship you. Be found. 
relax for a minute. This may be a little bit long of a welcome today. We've got a lot of things going on. So welcome to 1548 Heights Church. Uh, we're happy that uh, we've got a lot of guests today. Maybe some guests are viewing us online as well. Uh, one of the things that we really want you to do is, is register your attendance, but on the back of the card, let us know your prayer requests. And I encourage you all to go ahead and, and get with it and get the app. You can do your attendance, you can do your prayer requests, and trust me, I get an email every week when I add someone to the prayer list from Ann and others saying that they've been added, and uh, it really, really, really works. So today, it's the great chili cook-off for discernment process. And down here, we, we noticed this a little bit earlier, the very tiny print at the bottom says it's about the discernment process, but I want you to know there is, there is actually a cook-off going on later. You're going to learn about the discernment teams, the ones that you can join. So take, a, take one of these from the back and learn a little bit more about it and then come tonight. Be prepared to ask questions for all the people that are uh, cooking the chili and uh, that are manning the work groups. They will tell you how to share and invite. They will tell you uh, about governance. They'll tell you about children's ministry. Uh, all kinds of crazy good things that are uh, exciting here. Also, we have a lot of small groups. This is also at the back. Please take one, join one. We invite you to the one that's called Goof, which I took exception to, but then I found out it's uh, Garden Oaks Oak Forest, so go figure. And then there's lots of, again, there's other ministry opportunities. This is a small church, but we invite you all to participate as much as possible. I mean, God brings us all to different places. And uh, I mean, he's brought us all here today. So I just noticed the overcast has changed a little bit to sunny. That, that is a sign. Trust me, that's a sign from God that things are getting better in this world. And I, I, I know that we've got the Ukrainian crisis going on, but God will work through that for us. He'll help us. Um, so, like I said last week, um, uh, I really believe his creation is full of awesome wonder. So let's all rejoice and be glad and continue in our worship to our Lord and our Savior and his Father. Before we continue in our worship, we will be dismissing our kids, ages 10 and under, to go to the Backford Children's Church. The cross he proved, 
He is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's, and we will never forsake His all. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Never 
evermore will be breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. And standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step. We're going to read this prayer together. Um, I will read the words in uh, white, and if you will respond with the words that uh, appear in yellow. O God, our great shepherd, you tenderly gather us as lambs, carrying us with your all-embracing love. Yet like sheep, we wander from you, following our own ways, ignoring your voice, distrusting your provisions. Forgive our stubborn rebellion, our hardened hearts, our lack of trust. Refresh us once again by your quiet waters of mercy and restore our souls by your redeeming love. Give, guide our paths that we might follow you more closely. Through Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, we pray. Amen.
for you with our hands lifted high in praise and it's you we adore singing hallelujah singing morning. My daughter, our daughter, Alex, told uh, Matt and me a while ago, you've got to lis start listening to Exploring Your Strange Bible by Tim Mackey. And my father's favorite book in the Bible was Jonah. And so I listened to his ser series on Jonah. And I've not stopped listening since. I've just went through Daniel. Now I'm in Resurrection Sunday, which has been really powerful. And at the end of all of his sermons, he talks about it's time to come to the table and what that means. And it's been so convicting to listen to this almost every day I'm listening to a new podcast. Um, but I was thinking about the table that if Jesus died for us but never rose again, we are just eating crackers and drinking juice. There's no meaning at all. And a lot of people in this world live without the hope of resurrection or the belief in resurrection. And no wonder why our world is so upended and crazy, because there's no hope. There's no meaning. And we can just give in to whatever we want to give in to because there's nothing afterwards. But we have a living hope. And I've been thinking about this week, the last several days, of what's going on in Ukraine. And after really thinking about the hope we have in Jesus, I felt this tremendous peace. And I know I don't live in Ukraine. And I know I'm not going through what they're going through. But I keep thinking about this living hope that we have in Jesus. And so Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you who are being protect, protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this we rejoice even if for now a little while you have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is why we come to the table. Jesus took on our sins, our ugliness, and died on the cross for us. And the hope we have is that he was buried, and that's why we come to the table. Would you please stand and pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to the table. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. my heart, Lord. Here's 
thanks for these gifts that God has given to us. Let's stand as we sing this song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. 
I've got the ministry spotlight today, just for a few minutes. I'd like to put the spotlight on our men. Next week, you, between the announcement of the bulletin and me and Matt and Alan and others pestering, you know that next week is a men's gathering. We call it that instead of the retreat. It's next Saturday morning, 9.30 to 11, here in the library. A good conversation, a lot of fun. If you talk to people who came last year, it, it was good. It's very good. And, of course, we'll have men together. We'll have to have an activity. So besides the workout that we're going to do in there, I'm kidding, no, no workout. Don't want to scare anybody off. But we will go to Top Golf afterwards, uh, about 11.15 or so, and then we'll have uh, a Mexican food buffet there. And you can play golf, or you can sit back and laugh at me and Matt if you want to. It's uh, no problem. You can register online on our website under events. If you go to the website and find events, it's $25 a person. And uh, looking forward to it. It's a lot of fun, and hopefully you can come. And thank you. Thank you, Randy. So some of the guys haven't registered yet who intend to go to the men's gathering, and we just would love to know that you're going to be there so we can give Top Golf a number. So go ahead and register now. If you don't have the app, like Alan said earlier, download the 1548 Heights app. Good morning, 1548 Heights members and friends online and in person. Grace and peace to you in abundance. It's so good to see your smiling faces today. And it's wonderful to see some new guests. We hope you've been greeted and welcomed very warmly to uh, indicate how happy we are that you're here. Uh, next week is a special Sunday at, West, uh, at 1548 Heights. March 13th is Baptism Sunday. We set a date about once a quarter to just encourage people who uh, are feeling the stirring of God to be baptized, to publicly express their faith in Jesus and repent of their sins, and so we want to encourage you, if you feel that it may be your time for that, to let me know or let Ann know, put on your card, and uh, we would love to help you be baptized next week. We have one person who's planning on that. I'm sure uh, there may be others of you thinking of that as well. We're on the seventh week of a series on Esther, the book, the story of Esther in the Old Testament. We'll go two more weeks on this before turning our uh, focus to Easter. And I want to just review a little bit today. I know you all know Esther, the story of Esther, practically by heart, right? Right? Okay. And, uh, but I want to just review a little bit. This takes place between 483 and 473 B.C. in Persia, the empire of Persia. And the Jewish people have been in exile prior to this, but many of them have been sent back to Judea, but some have uh, decided to stay in Persia. So it's no longer an exile, it's more of a diaspora. They're living there voluntarily. And the question becomes, how do they live out their faith in this strange land? Well, when we began the story, King Xerxes deposes the queen, Queen Vashti, because she doesn't please him, and Esther is chosen. Esther, the Jewish girl whose cousin Mordecai is her supporter and guardian, and, and, and then the story continues moving forward, and Mordecai exposes some assassins who are planning to assassinate the king. They're his servants, and Mordecai exposes them and reports them, and this is noted but not rewarded. And you'll see there on the slide that it just sort of passes by. It's just tucked in there in the story that this has been noted, but it's never been rewarded. And then Xerxes promotes a man named Haman to a position of next in line or second importance to the king. And Haman talks Xerxes into decreeing that everyone in the kingdom shall bow and do obeisance to him in his presence. Well, Mordecai will not do that. And he discloses that it is because he is Jewish. And Haman is so infuriated that he talks the king into issuing an edict that Jews all over the empire of Persia will be destroyed on a day decided by the rolling of the dice, if you will, the Purim casting lots, and it happens to be 11 months later in the calendar. So that is now set. 
The time is set for the destruction of the Jews. Well, Mordecai convinces Esther, who is the queen, to intervene for the Jews. And she says, do you know that I could get killed intervening like this without being asked to come see the king? And he says, well, you're certainly going to be killed either way. You may be in that position for such a time as this. And so Esther decides to intervene with the king. And she goes to the king and she asks for a meeting with the king and Haman. And for some reason, she delays. She doesn't tell him what she wants. She says, well, let's have another banquet tomorrow. And it is in that delay that what we're going to talk about today happens. So I'm going to read chapter 6, verse 1 through 14, the passage we're going to focus on today. And I'm going to comment a little bit as we go through. So it'll take a little longer, but follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 14 of Esther. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of records, the annals, and they were read to the king. Let's pause. So often in the Bible, it's in people's dreams that God reveals something to them. But here, it's not in someone's sleep, it's in someone's lack of sleep. And the king, like a lot of us do when he can't sleep, he says, well, let me pick up something to read. There's, there's none of soap or sermons around here, so let me, let me, let me bring me the annals of the king. Now, these, these are the, you know, the dry kind of uh, uh, meeting reports, you know, picture C-SPAN in Congress, you know, it's just blah, blah, blah. And so he's sitting there reading this, Okay. And let's continue. It was found written, verse 2, how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had conspired to assassinate King Ahasuerus, which is King Esther. So here's that small event that happened that just sort of disappeared, but now it's coming back. Verse 3, then the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the king's servants told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. Now, did you catch this? Haman is so eager to go in and tell the king, I've decided to hang Mordecai on this 75-foot-tall gallows, and I want you to let me do it today, that he is there, essentially, in the middle of the night. And the king says, well, well who's in the court? Meaning, who of my officials could carry this out? And they say, well, look, there's Mordecai. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Isn't this so interesting? He doesn't say, Haman, I'd like to order, I'd like to honor Mordecai. What, sh what should I do for him? And, Morde and Haman would say, uh, give him a stale biscuit or something, you know. But he just, he, he disguises it. We don't know why. He says, what should be done to the man who the king wants to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king want to honor more than me? So Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king wishes to honor, let the royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden with a royal crown on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Haman has given, been given so much status already by King Xerxes that the only thing he really lacks is the robes 
You notice three times the robes are mentioned and the king's horse. The robes and the king's horse. And in Persia, there was sort of a, 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 a superstition or a belief that anyone who wore the king's robes sort of had the king's authority magically, you know, kind of bestowed to him. And Absent that, there was still, still the visible authority. It's like the president saying, take Air Force One. You know, all the, all the, the prestige of that is, is given to the one wearing it and riding the king's horse. Verse 20, then the king said to Haman, quickly take the robes and the horse as you have said and do so, listen, not just to Mordecai, to the Jew Mordecai. This, it's, it's like a nightmare that's getting worse and worse. The one who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and robed Mordecai and led him riding through the open square of the city, proclaiming, thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Oh. Jewish rabbinic tradition suggests that anyone in this role of helping someone up on a horse, you know, is in a servant role, and that what Haman had to do was kneel down like this and let Mordecai step on his neck. Oh. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. Did you catch that? Haman is mourning with his head covered just as Mordecai mourned in sackcloth and ashes before when he heard the fate of the Jews. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai before whom your downfall has begun... If he is of the Jewish people, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. This is astounding. Haman apparently hasn't told his wife and friends that Mordecai is Jewish. And they so, you mean the one you plotted all this against is Jewish? We would have told you that's a fool's errand. And somehow they're aware of Yahweh's covenant faithfulness. No, if you're plotting on the downfall of the Jews, it's not going to happen. Verse 14. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman off to the banquet that Esther had prepared. So the story is rushing forward now. Haman is being swept along with it. He is no longer directing events, but is now being directed by events. And so, I've used up most of my time already. That's it. No, uh... We're reminded of three things in this passage. And the first is that God is a God of great reversals. God is a God of great reversals. We see this in the biblical story. You know, the people of Israel in bondage in Egypt, working as slaves, and God takes them out of Egypt, and he parts the Red Sea, and he reverses, he reverses their status. We see this in Jesus' ministry. You know Jesus who says, uh, let me tell you something about the kingdom of God. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we see it in Mary's song, Mary's Magnificat, when she says, the rich and the proud and the mighty will be brought low. And we see James in his epistle echo those sentiments. Friends, God is the God of great reversals. And most notably, most notably, the defeat, quote unquote, of the crucifixion is reversed to the victory of the resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Friends, be wary. Be careful when you are in the powerful majority. 
and you go, oh, God must be with us. Look how many of us there are. Look how powerful we are. Look how much influence we have. Because God is the God of great reversals. Here we see the beginning of Haman's great reversal. Max Lucado, in his book that we're using as a conversation partner, puts it this way. Read it with me. Behold, the first of several reversals of fortune in this story. Haman intended to put Mordecai on a spike. Instead, Haman placed him on a horse. Haman planned to lead Mordecai to the gallows to the sound of jeers. Instead, he led him through the street to the sound of cheers. Haman wanted the king to throw him a parade. Now he just wants to throw up. (laughs) Friends, God is a God of great reversals. The second thing we're reminded is this. God whispers more than he shouts. God whispers more than he shouts. Lucado entitles this chapter, God is loudest when he whispers. Note how exquisitely the story unfolds. Xerxes can't sleep. So what is brought to him to read? Of all the things that could be brought to him to read, it is the annals of the king. And what does he turn to? He turns to the section that has Mordecai's deed recorded. And what does he think? Wait a minute. Did we ever reward this guy? And he asks his servants, and they say no. And he asks, who's in the court? Are there any of my officials around? And who does it happen to be? Haman. If any of these dominoes doesn't fall, the story stalls. And one other thing. Esther delays. Remember, she asked the king for a banquet, or she says, I'm going to have a banquet, you and Haman. And she goes in, and and it seems all set up to say, do you know what Haman is planning to do to the Jews? Do you know that I'm Jewish? I plead with you, O king, do not let this happen. Instead of doing that, she says, here's what I ask. Remember, the king has said, anything you want, my buttercup. And, and, uh, and, <laughs> and she says, can we do this again tomorrow? Why? We're never given a reason. Has she heard a, a slight whisper, a felt a nudge, a conviction? We don't know, but look what it allows to happen. The sleepless night, the reading of the annals, the decision to honor Mordecai. What if she had not stalled? None of that would have happened. God is loudest when he whispers. God whispers more than he shouts. So often we want God to wield a butcher knife. (laughs) And he wields a scalpel. So often we want God to use an axe. And God uses a pruning hook. So often we want God to throw down fire and brimstone. And he lights a small fire that begins to spread. Many of us can think of situations in our lives when we've thought, how will I manage this? How in the world will I get through this? How can I go on? And then there's a little slight change of the situation. It's like God has just whispered something to someone and they do this and, that, and something starts to happen. and you're, you, you've given, you're given some hope, as Angela talked about. It's not not a big forest fire. It's just a little fire lit, a little whisper, not a shout. And so, friends, God is the God of great reversals, and he whispers more than he shouts. The third thing we're reminded of is that God is working in people and events to fulfill his redemptive purposes. God is working in people and events to fulfill his redemptive purposes. God is always about redemption, friends. God is always about redemption, rescuing, restoring, healing, upholding, one person, one event at a time. God is gathering up the world to himself, redeeming the world, healing the world, fulfilling his redemptive purposes. Karen Jobes in her commentary on Esther says, imagine this, Persia is a polytheistic culture. There's a belief in many gods, and whenever events unfold in a way that is unfavorable to you, you think to yourself, 
well, someone else's God got the better of my God today, and that's why things didn't go my way. And the whole thing is sort of capricious. It, 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 there's no rhyme or reason to it. And Job says, but this story declares that something is happening underneath the surface. There is a force at work that people of faith acknowledge as Yahweh, as God, that is deeper than all the others. And she points out that in the 3rd century B.C., when the story of Esther is translated into Greek, because the whole uh, ancient world is speaking Greek now, and more and more Jews could not read Hebrew, that the, in the translation, the wording is changed to, and God took Xerxes' sleep away. Friends, God is working through people and events to fulfill his redemptive purposes. Lucato tells in this chapter a story about a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I uh, mentioned him a few weeks ago, a particularly impressive and heroic person in my mind. Here's a picture of him. Born in 1918, right after the revolution in Russia when began, as someone puts it, the siege of communism. Solzhenitsyn was brilliant and precocious. He longed, his desire, his ambition was to be a writer and a scholar. And he was exposed by his mother to Russian Orthodox Christianity, but he chose instead over time to be a disciple of Marx and Lenin. He was even awarded a Stalin scholarship to university. And he was on his way to a brilliant literary and academic career, except that World War II happened. And in 1945, he was falsely accused of treason and arrested. And in the words of Lucado, he was sucked into the hideous undertow of Soviet totalitarianism. And over the next eight years... He circulated around a system of prisons known as the Gulag. And little by little, his faith in the Soviet regime diminished. In January 1952, seven years after he was in prison, he discovered a lump in his groin, and it was diagnosed as cancerous. And he received a visit from a Jewish doctor who had recently converted to Christianity. And Solzhenitsyn wrote in his book later, one of his books, about this Jewish doctor. Fervently, he tells me the story of his conversion from Judaism to Christianity. I am astonished at the conviction of this new convert, at the ardor of his words. Alexander soon became a professing Christian. And after books, he wrote, after prison, he wrote books and he lectured and his most notable book, probably, is a book called The Gulag Archipelago. Let's see a picture of it here. Archipelago means a system of islands, like Indonesia is an archipelago. And here's what it is about. Look at this picture. All the political prison camps around the Soviet Union, look at all the dots, just dotted around the country where the Soviet Union sent regular criminals but also political pr prisoners. You don't like so what someone's saying? Call them a, call them a, 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 a treasonous person and send them to the gulag. And he wrote a book that exposed it all. And the West just marveled at this. Look at a couple of the comments that were made. This is the greatest and most powerful single indictment of a political regime ever leveled in modern times. Someone else said, it is impossible to name a book that had a greater effect on the political and moral consciousness of the late 20th century. You see, Solzhenitsyn gave a lecture at Harvard in 1978. He was so well known and thought of around the world that the Soviet Union couldn't contain him. They couldn't, they couldn't imprison him again because everyone, you know, it would bring such bad repute 
on, on, on the Soviet Union. And so he's lecturing at Harvard, and everyone is expecting him to talk about how wonderful America is and Harvard is and freedom, rah, rah, rah. And instead, he said, he, he, he entitled the lecture, A World Split Apart. And he said, let me tell you something. The West will be ruined by its material prosperity because you are moving towards spiritual poverty. He said the human soul longs for deeper and nobler things than simply unrestrained enjoyment of everyday life. And he had this gravitas, this incredible moral uh, credibility that allowed him to say this. Well, all that being what it is, what about that Jewish doctor? He was accused of being a stool pigeon, which is an informant, and he was bludgeoned to death by his fellow prisoners the morning after he shared his faith with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I wonder what prompted him to share his faith on that night, a whisper, a nudge, a gut conviction. Friends, God is working through people and events in the world to fulfill his redemptive persons. Listen, look around, take heart. He is the God of great reversals. The God who whispers louder than he shouts. The God who is always working through people and events to fulfill his redemptive purposes. Isn't it significant what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13? He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Enabling you to not only find what it means to be who God created you to be, but in doing that to help him fulfill his redemptive purposes. Take heart, friends. In closing, I want to just mention a, almost an anecdotal, insignificant thing I read two days ago. And maybe some of you have heard it. You've heard mention from Angela and Allen, Ukraine. We're all watching this terrible injustice of Russia invading Ukraine. And I just read this little new, uh, news item. And it was that somehow a few people got started and it started to spread where they got on Airbnb and they purchased rooms in Ukraine. Not having any intention to use them, but just knowing that people needed the money. And then they would, they would communicate with the host, this is just to, to know we support you and we know you need the money. And it started with Americans and then Canadians and then British. It may have spread beyond that now. 60,000 rooms. Hey, we're just going to pay you money. We don't care about the room. We're not coming over there. We can't come over there. But to know we stand with you. And then Airbnb says, hey, you know what? We're going to stop charging any fees for these transactions so all the money can go to the Ukrainians and now more companies are saying how could we in a totally unofficial capacity somehow help the Ukrainians it's nothing geopolitical it's not coming from any government anything from on high it's little fires starting oh so beautiful so powerful. Friends, God is working in the world through events and through people to fulfill His redemptive purposes, and His whispers are far more common than His shouts, and He is a God of great reversals. Take heart, friends. Whatever you are struggling with, pray to God, Lord, I trust in You. I, I hope in You. You are my hope, and I know you can work in ways that I have no idea because you are the God who is always at work to bring about your redemptive purposes. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord.
We need hope so often, but boy, we know that other people need it even far more than we do. People in Ukraine, people in enduring active suffering and injustice. Uh, but we need it with our little struggles too, which aren't little to us. And so, Lord, we, we take heart from the story of Esther. <laughs> All these little things that happen, we, why would they happen? Well, we believe there is a hand behind them, bringing them about who knows far more than we do, who is wise and good and kind and merciful, who is about redemption. Thank you, Lord. Help us trust in you completely so we can have the living hope that Peter talks about. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the greatest reversal, risen from the dead over the supposed tragedy of the crucifixion. In his name we pray, amen. Let's sing Everlasting God. Sing the rises we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Sing the rises we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon our Thank you so much, Jared and Susanna, as always. Friends, we're going to go do three things, three things tonight at 5 p.m. We're going to eat great chili, okay? Second, we're going to vote on what is the best chili. Be thinking about who you want to give second and third and fourth and fifth place to because Angela's, my team's going to have first place. But third, third and most important, we're going to get to know the next steps in the discernment process. You're going to hear about each of the action areas that we're going to move forward in, and you're going to sign up to be a part of one of them. That's what the whole thing is for. See you at 5 o'clock tonight, Lord willing, if you can make it. May the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today. God bless you. So this purchased by His blood.